uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. So welcome to uh, our Thematless Society uh, talk, the season two, episode eight. So uh, today's agenda is that uh, first, I'll give, uh, I think I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm Jin Xin Li, and I'm currently an uh, assistant professor at Biomedical Engineering at Michigan State University. And today's agenda is that I will uh, just take one minute to introduce the TMS. And then uh, our host, uh, Fernando Soto, who is a, a postdoc at Stanford, he will give the introduction of today's uh, speaker. And uh, then the speaker, uh, Zinab, will uh, take about 45 minutes to give us a talk to share her research. And then we will have about uh, 20 to 30 minutes uh, Q&A. So if you have any question, you, you can just, I think, uh, uh, put in the chat box. Uh, first, I would like to talk about the TMS. I think uh, is a is a good idea, I would say, and also is a is a good community that uh, which we want to encourage young young researchers to share your research, your also your thoughts. Uh, I think uh, we have a diversified um, topic in our event, not just academic talk, but we also have like uh, for example, as we can see from here, uh, the chief, editor in chief of Matter. Dr. Cranford also talked about uh, uh, the journal and how we submit and what, what is their standard, how they select uh, papers. Also, I think recently we also have Joe Wang, who is a stand-up comedian, talk about his experience on how he transferred from a biochemist to a, a stand-up comedian. And, uh, he also shared his experience, how he finds racism in the United States. I think, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of diverse topic uh, subjects which we can um, share and, and communicate through this, uh, this platform. So I encourage everyone, if you uh, are interested in share your research, are interested to nominate someone, uh, to recommend someone to uh, give a talk here, or you want volunteer as a host or as a moderator, you, ju you just go to the website or follow up our Twitter or send us an email. I think uh, we'll be happy to uh, connect with you. So now I'm going to uh, switch this to their host, uh, Fernando Soto, uh, who is a Schmidt Fellow, as well as a postdoc uh, at Stanford University. Yeah, Fernando, go ahead. Thanks. Well, um, again, uh, thanks for um, the invitation to become a host here. And today I'm uh, very interested in, in the profile of Sina Behead because it's a very interesting interdisciplinary profile. That's I think what's gonna be the future of research. How do you combine different fields? Her work is basically, uh, if I cut it correctly, is the question is how do you digitalize biology? How do you go so analog to digital? And in her work, she, therefore, she has been trying to um, combine this nano micro technology or nanotechnology with biology in order to get and combine also with computer science in order to get more information. And uh, she has a, a very good uh, background in different top universities. She did her uh, master's in um, the University of Waterloo. Then she did her PhD in the University of Berkeley. Then she worked at, as a uh, postdoc at Stanford. And until recently, she'll become a professor at, at the Department of Nanoengineering. That I'm very proud of because I got my PhD from there. And it's a very beautiful place with a very diverse uh, area, right? You have people on one side who's working on batteries. Next to them is working on, on biology and tissue engineering. Next to it is wearable devices. So you'll have a very uh, good home there. And um, well, without any more introduction, uh, she'll just talk about the design of intelligent nanoelectronics or biological applications. Go ahead, Professor. Thank you very much, Fernando, for that kind introduction. I could have, couldn't have have described the nanoengineering department um, any better than, than you did. Let me share my screen first. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good, good evening to all of you. Um, thanks to the TMS Society for organizing such a great event, and I'm very excited for the opportunity to remotely present my work to you all. Um, you, all you young scholars joining from various um, continents around the world. And as Fernando mentioned, I started my lab here at University of California, San Diego, uh, just a few months ago. But a lot of the research that I'll be presenting to you today is from my PhD um, and postdoc work at Berkeley and Stanford. And the topic that I'll be talking to you about today will be on designing and optimizing nanoelectronics for biological applications. I assume that 
Uh, most of the people joining will have some kind of science or engineering background, but I'll still try to define all the terminology that I'm using. But if you do, um, if I do use terminology that you're unfamiliar with, please ask, or um, you can ch uh, ask in the chat, or um, you can wait till the end to ask more questions. But please um, feel free to ask if, if I'm using terminology that you're not familiar with. So um, the field of bioelectronics is a relatively broad field. Um, of interfacing electronics with biology to measure, manipulate, and sense biological uh, processes. And this uh, research area encompasses uh, research such as wearable sensors all the way to implantable sensors such as this Utah array that I'm showing here, where um, each of these micro uh, pillars or micron scale, um, uh, what we call pillars, are, uh, can individually record and stimulate neurons um, when interfaced with the brain. And so this is the general field of bioelectronics. Now, the miniaturization of bioelectronics could have two main advantages. Um, first, if our probes are smaller than the size of the single um, biological unit or cell, we can measure single cell or subcellular activities. Um, additionally, if our probes are small, we can, um, we're less likely to perturb the biological system and cause anything such as an observer effect. So um, there's a need, uh, for nanoscale electronics for biological sensing. Um, and along with advancements in nanotechnology, um, these have given rise to the exciting field of nanobioelectronics in the past few years. And our particular interest is in designing nanoelectronics for measuring electrical activities in cell that exhibit electrical signals. And this is a picture of me holding the newest generation of our devices. Um, basically, uh, we use nanopillar arrays to sense electrical activity from a population of active cells, as you can see in this video down here. So these are um, cardiomyocyte cells on our chips and they're beating and we're able to measure electrical um, activity from these with a really high signal to noise and in a high throughput manner. And um, this is where we are now, but throughout my talk, I will try to give you the story of how we got here through some very fundamental characterization studies of the interface of cells with nanomaterials. And um, in my opinion, in order to um, design intelligent nanobioelectronics um, that are gonna be interfaced with biology, we need to employ a three-tier research approach. So first, um, we must carefully characterize the complex interface between nanomaterials and biological systems. This is a scanning electron microscope image of a cell um, sitting on top of a nanopatterned uh, surface. And you can see how it, interact with this, it interacts with this um, surface. So, the first question is to characterize um, this complex inter interface and understand how these cells respond to these materials. Then we can leverage this knowledge to design our electronics to be more accurate and higher throughput. And then finally, we need to develop methods um, and employ data analysis tools to be able to interpret these large data sets obtained from these high throughput um, bioelectronics that we have designed. And so I'll present some of my work in each of these categories, um, starting with a, a little bit of introduction with this understanding um, aspect of it. So this brings me to the first part of my talk, which is um, about characterizing uh, the response of cells to nanopillars. So several studies um, have shown, mostly biological studies or biophysics studies, um, have shown that if you look throughout the human body, cells um, encounter topographic features of nanometer and micron dimensions um, in different tissue. For example, um, the basement membrane of epithelia and endothelia exhibit a complex 3D um, texture in the nanometer range. And these textures consist of bumps, ridges, pits, and grooves that form this complex topography of the basement membrane with which the cells interact. Similarly, um, images of the intramuscular connective tissue show fine arrangements of collagen fibers into hierarchical structures with micron scale features. And cells are able actually to respond to these topographic cues. So an example is like invading brain tumor cells that can move along these, um, the corpus callosum of the brain to invade neighboring uh, regions. And for this invasion, what they do is they're able to guide themselves by these nanofiber-like tracks. So they're able to sense these tracks and move along these tracks to invade neighboring tissue. And so these studies all suggest that cells have evolved to sense nanotopography and, they and the physical interactions between the cells and their environment can regulate primary cellular functions. So when we're um, building our sensors, we should keep this in mind that um, the interaction between our cells and our sensors are actually changing the behavior of the, of the cells as well, or the cells are able to respond to these cells. Um, 
the cells that I show um, under electron microscopy are not alive. So all the images that I show of cells, um, this is the question in the chat, all the images that I show of cells um, interfacing with um, the nanomaterials are, if they are SEM images, the cells are not alive. They're fixed in place um, and they are not alive. So that, I hope that answers your question. So um, several groups, um, so we said that uh, the topo topographic environment can regulate the prim primary cellular processes. And so several groups have been interested in understanding and manipulating cellular responses to topography. And thanks to advancements in, in nano and microfabrication, several researchers have um, tried to recapitulate this topography in vitro and, and um, also reduce the complexity, complexity of it so we can actually see how the cells are responding to these um, features. So groups have fabricated you know, patterns such as groove, fibers, and other kinds of gradient structures. And in our work, we're particularly interested in one type of topography, and that is um, vertical freestanding nanowires and nanopillars. Now, why are we interested in these nanostructures? Well, our interest in nanopillars began at a time when um, nanowires were becoming very popular in the semiconductor industry and being proposed as building blocks of electronic and optoelectronic devices. And several groups were beginning to consider these nanowires for biological applications. So um, these are just a few groups that, that use these um, nanopillars as, as building blocks of their nanoelectronics. Obviously, I'm missing a lot of groups probably here, but these are just some examples of um, freestanding nanowire or nanopillar-like structures for, um, for sensing applications. And um, there are several groups that, uh, this is obviously not an exhaust, uh, exhaustive list, in addition to us who are working in this field. And um, in order to fabricate these vertical nanopillars um, in a high throughput manner, we used uh, an electron beam and lithography electroplating technique. And so how this technique works is you essentially create a mold using electron beam lithography. So this is our mold here on the left. And um, you can put this mold into an electroplating bath which contains ions of your metal of interest. And you can pass a current through the system and the metal ions gain two electrons at the um, at the conducting interface and um, grow into the mold and they can grow into sh whatever shape your mold has. And so using this method, you can make um, nanopillars of various shapes and arrangements. Um, and for example, if you let the metal to grow longer, it will grow out of the mold. And so you can make these cool mushroom shaped pillars of various size that um, have some applications in, um, in sensing as well. So for simplicity, I refer to all these various vertical structures as nanopillars during my talk. So even if it's this mushroom shape or hollow pillar, I'll still call it a nanopillar. And so next, um, these are very early studies. We interface these nanopillars with mammalian cells. And um, again, I'm showing mostly SEM images here, but if you're interested to um, look further into the, the work that we did, we did uh, fluorescent microscopy as well um, to show some of these. But, um, we interfaced these pillars with mammalian cells and um, showed that the cells begin to attach to the surface and they can interact with the nanopillars within the first few hours of plating the cells on top of the surfaces. And over time, um, again, if you take another time point, fix the cells and take a scanning electron microscope image, you can see that the cells spread on these metallic nanopillars and they can grow into a confluent monolayer of, uh, of cells on the chips. So, um, this suggests that the cells are able to perform basic biological functions on our metallic platforms and they're able to grow and divide. And um, when we imaged uh, cells on a flat surface, we observed these random protrusions on the flat surface as the cell spreads on the flat surfaces. However, when you look at the cells on nanopillar arrays, you can see these uh, finger-like protrusions that can extend microns away from the cell body. Um, and the cell seems to sense and grab onto these nanopillars. And each of these images, you can see that the cell extends these protrusions, and these are um, known as philopodia. And with these protrusions, they can interact with these vertical nanopillars. And so one um, interesting uh, phenomenon that we saw was that the um, interaction between the cell and the nanopillar depends on the size of the nanopillars. So if you look at the SEM images on the top, for example, you see that the cells mainly sit on top of these really large uh, micropillars. And uh, uh, these pillars are above 500 nanometers in diameter. However, um, as the pillar diameter gets smaller um, and the spacing between the pillars um, get larger, 
the cell membrane actually wraps very tightly around these nanopillars and they interact with the pillar tops as well as the flat surface between the pillars. Um, and so uh, what we proposed on through some early studies and some other people uh, proposed this as well, is a model for cell attachment on cells um, on nanopillar arrays. And we suggested that the cells can wrap around small pillars and form attachments to the flat surface between the pillars um, when spreading on nanopillar arrays. Whereas for larger pillars, so they can form attachments at the base and then they can spread on these um, small pillars and wrap nicely around them. Um, for larger pillars, the cells um, have enough surface area to attach on the top of the pillars, and they tend to remain on top of the pillars after spreading. Um, now, after we propose this model, also a former postdoc in uh, the Tui lab at Stanford, um, she does uh, she developed this beautiful uh, focus ion beam SCM method, um, where using focus ion beam, you can cut out a slice um, and, and out a slice and image the interface of the cell with a nanopillar with higher resolution. And you can see using this method, you get very high contrast and um, very high resolution images of the, of the interface between the cell and the nanopillar. So um, she confirmed that the cell membrane wraps very tightly around nanopillar arrays um, if they have a 500 diameter or less. So in this image um, that you can see, it's cross section of a, a pillar interfacing with a, the uh, body of a cell. And this thin black line that you see at the, at the edge is the cell membrane. So the cell membrane wraps very tightly around these nanopillars. Um, and another thing we were able to show is that when you have hollow nanopillars, the cell um, can actually protrude into hollow nanopillars. And um, you can see this through uh, the images on the left, which are scanning electron microscope image, and the images on the right, which are fluorescent images. And you can see that um, the cells protrude uh, very nicely into the um, hollow openings of the nanopillars. So just to recap on um, the, the first part of it that I just talked about, to summarize what we found is that um, cells like growing on these uh, nanopillar arrays. So they can grow and uh, wrap really tightly around the nanopillar arrays, and also they can protrude into um, openings of hollow pillars. So, um, you know, although I alluded to this previously at the beginning of my talk, some of you might be thinking like, how can we actually use such detailed information about how cells interact with nanotopography? Now, um, if you remember, we talked about how cells have evolved to sense nanotopography and um, this sensation affects several bi biological processes such as tumor invasion. So understanding the mechanism of cellular response to topography has some fundamental applications such as better understanding the diseases associated with the cell's um, ability to sense topographic cues in the environment. And then additionally, we can use this knowledge um, in the field to, to use it for tissue engineering and to manipulate cells into more biomimetic architectures. That being said, um, these may be like more typical proposed applications for such studies, but um, there are some very immediate applications where we can take advantage of the responses of cells to topography and specifically nanopillars to manipulate and probe cells more intelligently. And so um, the, we go back to our three-tier research approach and I'm gonna talk about how we use this understanding of the interface between the cells and nanopillars, this basic understanding that cells like to wrap around um, small uh, nanopillars and, um, and, and they protrude into hollow nanopillars to design and optimize um, these uh, high throughput and highly sensitive um, bioelectronics or nanoelectronics. So the second part of my talk, uh, I will be talking about um, the, how we can use these nanopillars for electrical recording of um, individual cells. So, most of us know that our ability to think and sense is dependent on the electrical activity of our nervous system. Um, however, some might not be aware that the beating of our heart, which is one of our uh, most vital processes, is also coordinated by the electrical activity of our heart muscle cells. So um, this electrical communication is uh, performed through electrical signaling known as action potentials. So I'll be using the word action potential uh, quite a lot. So um, the electrical signaling of uh, neurons and heart muscle cells are called action potentials. And so the cell membrane in animals and plants maintain a voltage difference between the exterior 
and the interior of the cell called the membrane potential. So if you were to take a voltmeter and measure the voltage across an um, animal cell membrane, you would see that the, the interior of the cell has a negative voltage of about 70 millivolts relative to the exterior. And in most type of cells, the membrane potential usually stay, stays fairly constant. However, if you monitor the voltage across a neuron or a heart muscle cells, you would um, observe such waveforms or simply changes in voltage um, as I've drawn to scale um, in this animation. And these are known as action potentials. And they, these changes in voltage correspond to the opening and closing of various ion channels as the cells communicate with each other. So the most accepted um, method for measuring action potentials um, is the patch clamp technique. So in the patch clamp te technique, the, the cell is manually approached by a recording pipette. And after a mild suction of the membrane, as you can see in this video, the membrane ruptures and the pipette up, obtains access to the inside of the cell and can measure the potential inside the cell. And this is a beautiful method and, and currently used in most electrophysiology labs because it shows the true shape of the action potential. So this is how, this is the this being performed under a microscope. So this is the patch pipette and this is a beating cardiomyocyte and you can see the beautiful signals that you can obtain from these um, intracellular signals. So it's very, uh, it's the most, uh, tool used in electrophysiology labs currently because it shows the true shape of the action potentials and it um, contains information about ion channels. And it's still required by FDA for early drug development. So this patch clap te technique has to be used to um, test the effect of drugs on the heart um, of, of, and on the action potential of cardiomyocytes very early on. So there are obvious um, disadvantages of this technique. Firstly, the, the holes in the membrane created by the patch are, are very large and they result in cell death after doing the measurement. And second, uh, um, you have to, the main disadvantage is that you have to um, manually find each cell under the microscope and um, you know, patch on it and you could do them one by one. And so it's a, it's a relatively low throughput method. And you can imagine how expensive it, it would be in terms of uh, materials and time. And um, there have been some, uh, there are some attempts to automate patch uh, clamps and do several cells um, consecutively, but a lot of the automated patch clamp techniques require the cells to be in suspension. So you kind of disrupt this electrical, electrically connected cells. So you can't really study them as you would be able to in a, in a culture of cells. So um, there, are some, there are some methods for measuring electrical signals from a culture of cells in higher throughput. Um, and this is a very old technique um, where you're able to pattern several flat electrodes on a surface and you can interface these electrodes with cells. So using this method, you can measure some cellular activity simultaneously from several channels. Um, however, you have no access to the inside of the cell. So the signals you obtain from this method are filtered by a cell membrane and certainly very low information. And you can basically just see the, the beating frequencies of these cells. So. Um, so what we do is, um, the Bian Shao's lab had this early idea was what if, uh, sorry, this is, this is how like kind of signal that you can get from these sensors. So each of these channels can, can do a recording from an individual cell and you get um, very noisy signals, but you at least get the, you know, the beating or the, the um, beating frequency of, of the cells. That's the information you can get. So one early idea was what if we make these uh, electrodes instead of flat electrodes, um, we could make them like these sharp pillars, which could potentially rupture the cell membrane um, as done in pa patch clamp. And then therefore you would be able to access the, the interior of the cell and measure these action potentials. But it turns out after careful um, FIB, uh, focus ion beam and SCM images uh, done by several of my colleagues in the TUI lab, um, that the cell membrane uh, tightly wraps around the nanopillar, but the membrane, but the pillar always remains um, outside, and the membrane remains fully intact, and there's no obvious pores in the membrane. So, in this method, what these nanopillars cannot obtain access to the inside of the cell. So, uh, to overcome this issue, a, a method was developed by Professor Chui's lab, um, which borrows from the field of DNA um, delivery to use electroporation to obtain intracellular access. And so this method, um, you can create small pores in the cell membrane by applying a small local electrical pulse to the cell. And remember this is very local because the only thing that's exposed 
or is electrically conductive is this part of the nanopillar and the rest of the surface is insulated. And so you can create these pores by applying a small electrical pulse and then send you, therefore you can breach the cell membrane. And then the created pores in the membrane provide a purely resistive impedance and you can go from very low information extracellular signals to um, intracellular signals. And there is some attenuation in the single a signal compared with patch clamp because uh, due partly to the seal between the cell and the nanopillar. So um, this attenuation is caused by these um, resistance that we, we are that are created between the, the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. So when we first um, started working on this project, a colleague and I were trying to develop um, an easy fabrication method to make these nanopillar electrodes. And we came up with the, the same method presented in the previous part of my talk, which is to electrodeposit nanopillars from the bottom up into the uh, molds made by electron beam lithography. So the only uh, difference here is that we typically fabricate our sensors on transparent substrates to be more compatible with biological imaging. So this method is very versatile. And as I mentioned, you can make, um, you know, fabricate electrodes with various shapes. And so what we did next was we uh, plated, sorry, we plated um, cells on top of these nanopillars uh, as I'm showing here. Um, and this is a video just taken with my phone camera through the microscope lens. Um, so uh, as cells sit on our nano electrodes, we're able to obtain these uh, low level, uh, high signal, uh, low signal to noise um, extracellular signals. And then indeed, after applying a small pulse, we're able to obtain um, intracellular signals um, from, these, from these pillars. So, but then the problem is uh, our devices are quite, we're quite un, unreliable and um, the electroporation didn't always yield intracellular signals. And um, additionally, the amplitudes of these signals were quite low compared with patch clamp technique, which uh, you know, made it less exciting to, to you know, work on with these devices. So we identified one major flaw with the fabrication technique, and that was the mechanical integrity of the nano electrodes that were made through this method. So because the nanopillars are grown from the bottom up on our substrates, um, some small forces can detach them from the surface. And in the behinds of, uh, behind the scenes of the research, which we don't normally show, we observed that the forces generated from subsequent fabrication steps can easily detach the electrodes from the surface. And most importantly, when interfaced with um, biology, the cells don't particularly treat the electrodes um, with care, as you can see in these SDM images, um, where the cell is attempting to engulf the nanopillars. So um, you could also imagine the amount of force that is coming from a uh, group of beating heart muscle cells, which destroys our sensors. So these are a group of beating heart uh, muscle cells, and, and they beat pretty strongly, and they can destroy the sensors. So um, the main disadvantage of this technique, this bottom-up technique, was the fact that the nanopillars were not robust enough and they're not ideal with, in, for interfacing with biology and you know, consecutively using for multiple days to measure these signals from cells. And additionally, um, although it was a relatively fast method for growing nanopillars, um, we, we had to uh, do uh, the electroplate, uh, separate electroplating steps for each um, single sen sensing device, which made the, the fabrication very tedious. So instead of the original bottom up method to make the uh, to make the pillars and in order to get more mechanically robust uh, and stable pillars, we proposed the method to fabricate these pillars using a top down approach. So um, in this top down approach, the pillars are directly etched into the substrate um, through reactive ion etching. And after we remove uh, our photoresist, we can then coat our electrodes with some uh, conductive metal, any any conductive metal uh, like platinum or gold that can be um, sputter coated onto our surface. And as you can see, these uh, now these pillars are attached to the substrate at the base and much more difficult to detach de um, with the pillars. So they're much more mechanically robust than these bottom up pillars that we um, fabricated before. So um, using this method, we can also fabricate simultaneously depending on how um, large our wafers are, we can do a wafer-based production and we can fabricate up to 12 sensing devices on a, uh, on, based on our wafer size at, at this point, but it could be more if you had a bigger wafer size to start. So um, this is what our current devices uh, look like. We have our measuring electrodes um, and we have some stimulation pads, which we can stimulate the cells with. 
And the ma main advantage of this method was the ability to fabricate robust electrodes, um, which were uh, continuous with the substrate at their base and that would not be damaged by the cells or other forces. And so we anticipated to have more reliable, you know, electro um, operation uh, using this method and more reliable readouts. Um, and additionally, the, the method, because of the pillars more, more mechanically robust, we could make even higher aspect ratio pillars with this method. And so the advantage was that we could um, later deposit thicker layers of insulation to insulate um, the, the so substrate better and even reduce the signal leakage even more. So we tested these um, electrodes and we found that indeed the top-down fabrication um, yields almost 10 times better signals than we what we were obtaining before. So we were getting microvolt um, range signals and now uh, we were able to get millivolt, tens of millivolt range signals. And um, in addition, the the method yielded much more successful electroporation, meaning that like if we saw an, elect an extracellular signals from the cell and we applied the short pulse, we would al almost always obtain a intracellular signal. So we attributed these to the improvements um, to the robustness of the electrodes, as well as the thick insulation layer that um, we were able to um, deposit using this new fabrication technique. So we were very happy with um, these results, but then we asked whether we could improve this signal even more and if you remember, I showed previously that the cells tend to protrude their membrane into the openings of hollow nanopillars. So this is a, a, a again, FIB SEM image um, by one of my colleagues um, in the in the Tui lab showing that the cell membrane protrudes into hollow nanopillars. So this is a hollow nanopillar uh, uh, cross section, and you can see that the cell protrudes inside the hollow pillars as well, and, and make more attachments even at the sides of the nanopillar. So um, in addition to that, we, um, so this is, sorry, I, I guess this slide didn't show, um, you can see here that as a, in a schematic that the cell membrane actually protrudes inside the hollow pillar. So we thought uh, maybe we could make semi-hollow nanopillars so that the membrane can even attach at the base of the pillars, um, such as the one I'm showing in the schematic here. Uh, we also did some uh, modeling and we saw that the, um, electric fields can, can be enhanced at the, at the edges of the hollow nanopillars, and this would make the um, electroporation even more localized to the edges of, of, the, um, of the hollow nanopillars. And so making these uh, semi-hollow pillars was very straightforward from our proposed top-down fabrication technique. So we could simply etch off um, the metal from the tip of our uh, nanopillars using dry etching, and then we could use uh, a wet etch to etch a little bit into our quartz pillars. So um, this allowed us to fabricate these structures, which are which we call semi-hollow nanopillars. So the, the pillar is not completely hollow. The impedance is, is increased because now some of the surface area inside the pillar is also exposed. So, um, and but then um, the, the base of the pillar is still that strong um, glass base. So it still maintains the integrity of the pillar. So um, it doesn't compromise the robustness or mechanical robustness of the pillars. So we were able to obtain um, our highest amplitude signals using these um, thin shelled hollow pillars. So um, here's one example I'm showing here, which is completely raw data. Um, and uh, the, they could, um, we could reach up to eight millivolt extracellular amplitudes and uh, 40 millivolt amplitudes for intracellular signals. This is an old data point. I think we, our highest um, amplitudes are now around 60 millivolts. So if you think about it, the patch clamp, um, gives you around 90 millivolts, which is the exact voltage difference between um, the, the cell, the interior of the cell and the exterior. So we're getting very close to the same, um, same amplitudes, at least for our signals. And note that this is only a short, like 200 microsecond and three volt pulse that was applied to get um, intracellular access. So the, the signal drops over time and, and goes back um, to extracellular. So the cell, you know, remains healthy on our chips for several days. And we can repeat these measurements um, for several days because the cell, because the pores in the cell close down and they can um, go back to, um, to beating, like to, to showing extracellular signals. So um, to see how our signals compare with patch clamp, because that's the gold standard technique. So um, one question is, um, how do you know that you're actually obtaining these 
intracellular shapes and how do you know the shape of your axon potential is accurate? And so to answer that, we um, did a pretty difficult experiment, which is um, a simultaneous patch clamp and measurement from our nano electrodes. So what we do is we approach our electrodes with a patch pipette. And um, at the same time of measuring um, with a patch pipette, we measure with our nano electrodes. And this is an overlay of the signals that we get from the two methods. And you can see that the, the two methods um, overlay very nicely. This is the exact same cell measured um, simultaneously using the two methods. And so this uh, suggested to us that our method is actually accurate. And then it, we did some quantification. We measured for about 30 cells and, and we did some quantification to see um, if there is any change. And you can see that's very low, uh, like very similar um, quantifications that we get from the nano pillar and the patch clamp method. And um, so since our nano electro platforms are now reliable and easy to make, and very scalable, we don't have a shortage of devices and we can run several parallel experiments. Um, this is a picture of our incubator um, before it left. And we're, we were doing you know, uh, 30 separate cultures and um, we were, with the ability to record from 30, 60 channels in each culture um, gave us a lot of um, opportunities to, to study uh, biological phenomena for, further. And I just want to go back and mention like how impactful such measurements could be, especially for cardiomyocytes, because um, for early drug development, still the only protocol accepted by the FDA is to characterize the action potential with patch clamp. So um, FDA requires you to um, do cardiotoxicity uh, uh, screening for any drug that's going to come on the market and to, um, to characterize this action potential with patch clamps. So you would patch on a few cells and you would add the drug and see how the shape of this action potential is changed. So one very common plot that they have is the drug dose response. So what this is, is on the x-axis, you would have your drug dose. So you would add different doses of the drug. And on the y-axis, you would do some quantification of, of some uh, features of this action potential. For example, one is called the action potential duration 50. So that's around halfway between um, this point and this point, and you would measure the distance between these two points. So um, the action potential duration, APD 50, for example, how does that change when you're adding different doses of the drug? So that's a, uh, that's a common um, thing that's required by the FDA. And so, um, we actually tried this with our platforms because now we can get these really nice um, high amplitude signals that's, and also they um, were able to measure for very, uh, for a long period, close to what patch clamp can, can measure. So this is, for example, I think a 20 minute, or I'm showing maybe less than 20 minutes, but it's a 20 minute recording in which we, we can just um, start recording ourselves and we can record them um, for a long period. And during this recording, we can add different doses of the drug. So again, uh, this is uh, showing action, one action potential recording um, for, during a period of time. And so what we can then do is, is we can add these doses, different doses of various drugs that have different risks, um, different known risks, and then tr track this, um, the duration of this action potential. So for example, here on the bottom left, I'm showing a drug uh, called dofel dofelodite. And dofelodite is supposed to increase, is known to increase the duration of the action potential. And so what we can do is using our, our method, we can, we can develop these overlay plots, which shows exactly how this action potential changes by addition of different doses of the drug. So what I'm doing is overlaying one action potential from here, one action potential from here, here, and then right before adding the previous dose. And you can see how it clearly shows the increase in this, um, in the action potential duration. And this is very powerful because you're, remember you're doing self-referencing, you're, you're, you're measuring from the exact same cell and you're adding the drug to the exact same cell to see how it changes over time. And we tried different drugs that are known to have different effects on the, on the cell. So um, the first two I'm showing are supposed to increase the duration and the, the next ones are supposed to decrease the duration of the action potential. And then some of them change completely the shape of the action potentials. Um, so for example, this one is known to have early after depolarization. So you can see how the drug causes it to have a double peak um, instead of just a smooth um, transition. So 
Um, we can do uh, dose dependent. Um, we can get that dose dependent drug response. So a lot of the studies have, you know, can measure two to three cells um, for, and, uh, for using patch clamp uh, per day. And so we can get much higher numbers um, using our method. Um, and this is on a single platform and you can, you can test one drug, wash it out and then test another drug. You can test the same drug by washing out the drug and the cells go back to, to beating. So the, the, um, for one of the questions that we had was, um, is the chip reusable? Absolutely, we use these um, multiple times. For example, uh, I don't have that data here, but we have data showing that we tested um, three different drugs um, four consecutive days. On, on the same chip and we could, and the still cells were still beating healthy afterwards. So they're absolutely reusable. And then finally, um, we're also working on miniaturizing the recording apparatus. So um, in collaboration with um, Sound Technologies, um, which is a Bay Area startup, we uh, manufactured these uh, printed circuit boards that fit in traditional biology Petri dishes. And these dishes can then clamp into recording units that are um, compatible with humid and warm cell incubator conditions and, and can be recording in, in situ over a prolonged period of time without the need to take the cells out of the incubator. And this new setup has the potential to measure from, uh, much, from many more cells um, in parallel. And um, yeah, I want to go back to, uh, I'm, almost, uh, I'm getting to the last of my talk and I want to go back to the, the three-tier research approach that I proposed at the beginning of my talk and we discussed how we can um, you know use our understanding of the nanobio interface to design these um, sensitive and high throughput uh, nanobioelectronics and that came from knowing that the cells you know um, tightly wrap around the nanopillars to using these nanopillars to get a better seal between the cell and the nanopillars so we can get higher um, signal to noise um, but um, you know, with, with this technology comes, you know, the promise for massively paralyze, parallelizable methods um, uh, being developed by us and other groups. And the main challenge really becomes our ability to systematically extract information from these generated data sets. And um, having generated big data sets of action potentials, this was actually a real challenge we're facing um, this past year. And so, um, this brings me to the, the third part of my talk is um, how do we work on this interpretation problem? And, um, you know, I, I'm a runner and I was training for my first marathon and um, I joined the Palo Alto Run Club. And there I met this uh, Dr. Palowski from Google and, you know, joined some of the cool down runs, which is the only time I could actually keep up with her. Um, we had some great discussions about science and we realized that our research interests are well aligned um, as her team at Google was looking for a high throughput method to, to be able to measure electrical signals from cells for drug development purposes. So um, we got very interested, she got very interested in the work and um, invited me to present a talk at Google Accelerated Sciences team, which is a part of Google AI. And the talk was very well received and we got excited to work on this problem together. Um, and so, we were given a, a small um, seed grant from Google to work on interpreting the large data sets obtained from our nano electrodes. So I'll just briefly talk about one project that we're working on now. Um, it's hopefully you will see it out in maybe in a year or so. But um, uh, one of the first projects we're working on is taking advantage of this unique capability of our device, which is to measure both extracellular and intracellular signals from the cell. And um, these are examples of signals obtained on our devices where each extracellular signal on the left corresponds to an intracellular on the right. And remember, the only thing that makes it extracellular or intracellular is this poration that we do. So if, there's, or if our electrodes are just sitting outside the cell and we don't do any electroporation, we're measuring extracellular signals. Whereas when they are porated, they can me measure intracellular signals. Um, so now we, uh, we know this extracellular signal contains very noisy and low level information and they all look the same to our eyes, even with their corresponding um, intracellular signals, even though the corresponding intracellular signals are so different in shape. But what if we have a one to one correspondence between thousands of extracellular and intracellular signals and the question we ask is could we use this data to train a neural network so that it can classify our intracellular signals based on extracellular inputs. And um, this could be used to, uh, for example, identify cell subtypes just based on the extracellular signal. 
or identify some you know, cardiac toxicity markers based merely on the weak extracellular signal. So um, with these, uh, we, we could potentially not need to, to obtain intracellular access because that's still more invasive than having an extracellular signal. So um, we're, we're beginning to scale up um, to generate more data and because we would need thousands of good signals from each um, of these categories to have meaningful results for you know, try, training our convolutional neural nets um, with these data sets. So um, uh, that's where I'm gonna leave this project that we have had some promising results on this um, and we can with good uh, accuracy, determine actually we reproduce the extracellular intracellular signal just from the extracellular um, signals. And, and this, um, you know, I spent my whole talk trying to convince you that we need better tools for intracellular measurements. So why would I propose a project that could eliminate the need for intracellular measurements? Well, that's because we ultimately want to be able to measure signals in vivo. Um, through implantable sensors. And um, I think a lot of uh, people in this audience might be working on these implement implantable sensors. And we want these implantable sensors to be minimally invasive as possible. And so the best recording methods currently still yield um, only microvolt extracellular signals. So our idea is instead to try to better interpret these weak signals using AI and potentially eliminate the need for our in vivo sensors to be as sensitive as our in vitro sensors. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to just uh, conclude by highlighting some of the key points that I hope I've conveyed throughout my talk. Um, one was that the cells can, um, from fundamental studies, we showed that the cells can grow and, and wrap tightly around nanopillar arrays and cell membranes protrude into hollow nanopillars. And we said that this tight coupling um, between cells and nanopillars can be leveraged to design highly sensitive nanoelectrodes. And um, finally, that these nanoelectrodes have potential to accelerate drug discovery because now we can do these um, dose responses. And just for um, the, the young scholars and in the audience, I, my collaboration with Google really started through uh, my training for my marathon. So I just want to also mention that exercise is really good for your career. And um, to summarize, uh, I talked about this, uh, the vision or the three teacher tier research reports, but I really think, and my group will, will have these three sections um, when we're working on these projects. This fundamental work, although it's harder to get funding for and more difficult to do, it's very important for us to be able to design these um, electronics, because if we don't have the fundamental understanding of how this um, interface works, then our um, sensors could be detrimental to the bio biological system, or we won't be able to obtain the kind of measurements that we're interested in. And then finally, this um, interpretation aspect of it becomes very important because all of these um, tools that are being developed are mostly developed really high throughput data. And so we have these big data sets that we need to be able to um, manage and um, analyze. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge all the wonderful people I worked directly with or mentored um, at Stanford, Berkeley, Waterloo um, during my uh, into multidisciplinary research. And if I think all of the people in this audience know that multidisciplinary research would really not be possible without getting experts from all the fields involved. So I had the privilege of working with several chemists, um, some wonderful mechanical engineers, um, electrical engineers, uh, data scientists, and um, these uh, talented bioengineering uh, majors and bio biologists, and finally two amazing high school teachers um, and teachers to be that um, I had the privilege of working with. With that, um, I'd like to thank you all. So this is my lab at UC San Diego. Our website just went up, it's still not complete, but um, we call it the Bion Lab. It's for designing nanoelectronics for biology. And um, yeah, hopefully some of you will be able to visit and I'd love to host you here to give talks. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I think we can go to questions. I think there's some questions already in the chat, um, but yeah, I think I answered most of those questions. Thank you, Dina, for the wonderful talk. I think uh, we can start to answer the, I think there's like in the chat box, there are some questions. Um, 
Yes, I think, uh, yep, I tried to um, just, uh, answer some of those during my talk, mm -hmm. but was that the cells are alive under EM, and I mentioned that no, the cells are, are fixed, um, mm -hmm. the proteins are cross-linked, so the cell maintains its structure, but all the EM messages, images I showed, the cells are fixed, where um, we do for some fluorescent imaging um, to uh, to show the same thing with when the cells are alive, some, um, but I think SEM images are very nice because a lot of people who are not familiar or not biology backgrounds mm -hmm. can, can understand um, an SEM image more easily. Yep. I think there are two questions in the chat box. One is from uh, uh, Jin Tian Hu. I think uh, he or she oh, asked another? about the... Oh, I uh, see. I oh. didn't see the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. The question was uh, how the different contact uh, shapes influence the signal. I think uh, is there because the contact area, um, like my worry yes. uh, between the interface, I think that's the point. Yes, that's a very good um, question. We we noticed that it's not just the contact. The contact is very important. So I think um, both Bian Shao's lab and some other labs have spent a lot of time looking at um, what shape of pillar, what spacing of pillars increases this um, this contact. So that is very important. But other parameters that we noticed is the, um, for example, the, the insulation layer the how thick you're able to insulate your chip so you don't have any signal leakage. Um, and the, the, the height of our pillars actually really mattered as well. So um, the electro shape definitely is, is one of the biggest um, things that influences. And then the robustness of it, we noticed. So from our, our bottom up method, which was electroplating to our top down method, the shape of the pillars did not change too much. Um, but we believe that the, the cells are um, detaching the pillars or, you know, not the, the pillars are not as robust as, as a top-down method. So the fabrication method mattered for us as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the second question, um, I think there is Professor Han Bo Zhao. Maybe, maybe you yes, can yes, unmute yourself. I think since you are already on the panelist. Yep, thank you. Uh, so my question is kind of related to the one you had just uh, answered. Yes. Uh, how does the shape and geometry of the uh, pillar actual affects the amplitude of the uh, signal? The yeah, AQ? I think the amplitude also, um, so it depends on the seal between the cell, I believe. So one thing we noticed, let me go back to the hollow nanopillars. Um, So the amplitude depends a lot at, uh, about what happens when you do this electroporation. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna quickly um, go back to an old slide. So the amplitude really depends on what happens when we apply this pulse. So um, depending on, on how the cell is sealed with the, the pillars, it's really hard to study this obviously, but these are some um, hypotheses we have. One is that if the cell is not um, sealing very well with these pillars, then these pulses don't really create big pores, big enough pores in the membrane or not number, uh, enough number of pores in the membrane. And so the amplitudes are very low. Um, and then also if, uh, for example, if the, the voltage is is too high for the cell, the, the voltage that it feels, for example, if it's not insulated well in these areas, then there's too many pores and there's too much leakage um, of the signal. So we think really the, the most important is this, this great seal between the cell and the nanopillar, the localized electroporation, um, which is caused by you know everything else being insulated but the tip of the pillar. I see, thank you. Then You're how welcome. was the amplitude of the signal measured by this nanopillar electrode uh, overlap well with the, um, pen, the the patch clamp method in one of the uh, figures you showed? Yes, how, how does it? How, how, why did these two type of methods give um, almost the same signals, given that uh, you know, the amplitude of signal can be affected by the electrical shape and... You know, oh, um, yes. Um, so because you're comparing between patch clamp and nanopillars. Is that what you're comparing? Yep, yeah. So yep. we're still getting we're still getting almost half the amplitude of patch clamp, um, mm. but we believe that the seal, like, again, depending on the seal, we don't know exactly what kind of pores we're creating uh, on, in the membrane. But um, you know, they're just um, there's basically very small distance between the the pillar and the cell um, interior that we are able to obtain 
like almost patch clamp like intracellular access. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I have two more questions. <laughs> um, sure. One question is um, for the top down fabrication method, you deposit a layer of metal. Then yes. after that, did you have to deposit and pattern a layer of uh, insulation material to individually address the individual like electro? Yeah, so the way we do that is um, we first make, yeah, we first make our, uh, you know, top down nano pillars, and then mm -hmm. we deposit the, the metals, the platinum, for example, in the regions that we want. For the insulation, there's several ways to do this. We've tried different things. We, um, yeah, you can just, uh, we just spin coat a thin, uh, so for the insulation, we deposit a, uh, a thick layer, about, I think, one micron of silicon oxide on the whole surface, and then we etch it off from the tip of the pillars. Okay, so that's what you. we're doing now. But there's other ways of doing, I know people just spin coat SU8 on the surface, mm -hmm. and that's an insulation. Um, yeah, I, I know there's different methods of doing that. After that, do you have to pattern it so that, you know, all your, your electrodes are not all connected? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So we do a wet etch. We uh, do another patterning step, yeah. Got it, Thanks. We, we do another patterning step, exactly, yeah. So one last question is, um, do you need to make the pillars very, to have sharp tips to penetrate the cell membrane? So um, again, this is a big area of research in Pianxia's lab. It was that mm -hmm. no matter how sharp you make these pillars, um, we, have we have never seen through at least our microscopy methods that the membrane actually ruptures. The membrane of a cell is, is very interesting. It regenerates, like no matter how much you disturb it, it still forms a membrane around the pillar. So we do occasionally get something we call spontaneous intracellular access. That means without any electroporation, we see some intracellular signal, but we believe that's just some kind of charge building up on the pillars and still there's some kind of poration going on. So no matter how sharp they are, we don't think, at least we don't believe that they will be able to access the interior of the cell without some kind of um, electroporation. However, the sharpness again matters because of the, uh, for example, the electric pulse we're gonna apply for it to be localized um, in the cell and not disturb the cell too much. Because imagine you can even do electroporation if you had a flat electrode, right? But then, yeah, because then you, would, you don't know what you do exactly to the cell, there's gonna be several pores and it's not gonna be localized. So the sharpness still, still really, really helps with a good signal. Right, and that's you. why the, the hollow nanopillars that have very sharp edges, they give us very good signals. Thanks. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes. So I'm curious, how do you get a single cell to measure, to do the measurement? So we don't have single cells. As I showed you, we have a culture of cells, but the, okay. so you can see here, for example, we have a, a full monolayer of, of cardiomyocytes. So we have a, a culture of cells, but the cells, the pillars are small enough that they're, in, they're only interfacing with one cell. So, you, so, so how, how can you ensure that the, the pillar is not the, in between two cells instead yes. of... That's a very good question. And we cannot 100% ensure that. That's only by uh, the size of our pillars. So um, we're currently making some electrodes that only have one pillar. So we can assure that, you know, it's very unlikely for the, the, the electrode to interface with two cells. But we see that sometimes in our signals where you would see like an extracellular from one um, an extracellular signal mixed with an intracellular signal. We sometimes believe that's when, you know, there's more than one cell being measured. But mm -hmm. for most cases, we don't, we just see a single, you know, nice um, intracellular signal. But you, that's a very good question. That depends all on the size of our electrodes. And we do make them uh, about um, 10 times at least smaller than the cell size when it's um, spread. Mm -hmm. So we, we do so think that mo in most cases, we're measuring from a single cell. So based on what I saw, you only have a uh, uh, electrode on the bottom. Have you ever thought like you have another electrode on top, so you have have two tip measure the electrodes through this cell? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, three D um, cultures and measuring from three D cultures is definitely very interesting to have like deeper um, the pillar penetrating deeper into a, a cell culture. We have uh, there are some projects that we're thinking about to start with that to have three D cultures on top of these, but um, there are some studies where um, they measure from an actual heart on the chip. So like a full tissue, but that's still usually either one on the bottom. Um, and then with, I think with other types of methods, there's like two layer sensors, but yeah, with our sensors, it'll be really, it would be a little bit difficult to, 
to have um, something like that as a two layer in between because we'd have to assemble the second one on top. So, but that's okay. that's a very interesting idea. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Wen. Uh, I also want to ask a question about the deep learning part. So I work a little bit on this as well for optical stuff. So, uh, so when you implement the problem, do you mostly look at the signal from one or two, or do you also take the spatial arrangement of the uh, signal into account? Um, so, I'm trying to, yeah, go ahead. So are you also trying to analyze the uh, signals um, from, because you have multiple electrodes, do you also yes. try to analyze the signal coming from a different electrode at the same time? Do yes, you... we are. We are. We don't think, yeah, that's a very good question because um, when we were starting the project, we were thinking whether, um, whether the impedance of the electrode and the shape of the electrode is consistent enough across our chip to be able to like compare the different signals. But what we are doing is for our training of our um, uh, network, we only associate each extracellular and intracellular of the same electrode. Mm -hmm. So that's how we train our data set. So, but then, yeah, that's how we're doing it. And it's working pretty nicely for now. But yeah, we train it with, with all, with different electrodes, but each, each set of, you know, extra and intra is only from the same electrode. Mm -hmm. I see, great. I, I have following up question related with that. So you are, in, I just wonder like which uh, kind of providing the ground truth or for the training, like it's like uh, you, are, you are recording on the same cell. So I assume you should have some signal other ground truth if you uh, want to make the correlation, right? Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, so again, for all, so what we have is there's two ways we're doing this. We're trying different things. So mm -hmm. one is um, using the same rec the recording at the same exact time, which is from two very nearby signal, uh, um, two very nearby electrodes, and we're using the um, yeah the intracellular. We have the intracellular and the extracellular signal from both of those. Okay, so you're two one in inside the cell, one outside the cell recording. Yes, together. that's okay. that's exactly what I said. So this is the advantage of our technology because okay. we can have both of these recordings. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that's how we're yeah that's how we're fine defining our accuracy or whatever. It's we have all these signals available to us, so we have it for training, for validation, and for testing. We have we have the pairs of signals. Yeah, another question I have is about the chip you designed. I, I wonder, um, like, uh, to improve the channel. So, do you have any multiplexer on that uh, for the uh, for the device using now, or is that um, the cap capacity? I mean. Like a, I assume each electrode that you were our connector. Uh, yes. So that's a design for now. So I would, I would imagine uh, when you collaborate with this uh, startup, I yeah. uh, imagine that you're building some multiplexity on the chip. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They are doing that. Um, we're not. I'm not directly involved in the electronics design, but mm -hmm. definitely we're doing that. Yeah. Okay. So the last I have a comment rather than a question. I think for the rigid electrode might be, if they are being removed by the cell. Uh, if you're using some like soft pillar, you might be able to solve that problem, I guess. Yeah. Yes, definitely. The soft pillar would be, um, would be very nice if we could get, uh, yeah, if it, it's okay if it deforms it, as long as it attaches well to the soft pillar as well. Um, we haven't worked on soft, you know, conductive material yet, but that's a very interesting field that I think some people are working on. Yeah. I think I'm going to go through the last three, three some questions on chat box. Are the chip reusable? Yes, yes, I, I answered those questions, I believe. Oh, oh okay, I think. <laughs> I think that's, is that all? Um, oh, if you want to add um, a more general question, just you have a very interesting background working with in biology materials. Just uh, as a comment to all the audience, how do you, what, what do you think is the success for us um, the key for a successful collaboration between interdisciplinary teams, because you're working biologists, chemists. What are you looking for in a collaboration, for example? I see. Very good um, question. I think for me, how I always approach collaboration is: I thought if I, you know, think of a project, um, if there is a group that can has already developed the technology or can do, you know, part of the project better um, than than my group can, I would 
reach out for collaborations. So it's more as um, you know, using the um, the uh, the skills skill set of different labs to you know come up with this overall um, multidisciplinary project because it's very difficult. For example, if you're more um, uh, knowledgeable in the electronics aspect of it to to learn all the biological aspects of it or to buy purchase equipment that can that can do all those um, you know parts of the projects but it's much better to, to source to outsource for this and this happens a lot I think in industry you know um, but in academia it's a little bit more difficult because it's harder to, to create these big collaborations but I think it's getting becoming very common in academia as well where um, you know every person takes a side of this project and that's the only way to do it for for multidisciplinary projects so it's actually just looking out there for um, who has done this kind of work and who can do it um, well, you know, faster than you could start doing it in your own lab. So that's that's my opinion in, in terms of collaboration. Great. I think the next one is Xiao Chen. Uh, you have a question? You can unmute. Or... Sorry. Yeah, okay, it's fine. It's fine. I can ask. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is very interesting and very informative talk. And thank you for sharing. Uh, I'm actually a stranger to this field of uh, bioelectronics, but mm -hmm. I just have some like basic questions uh, for my sure. uh, understanding. Uh, sure. I'm just curious about the physics about like this um, cell get attached to this uh, nanostructure. Oh. Is it mm -hmm. like uh, governed by the surface tension and the adhesive mm -hmm. uh, force, or there's any uh, chemical reaction yes. when this uh, when they are in contact? Yes, yeah, that's my, yeah. Yeah, I have a, a, a second question. It's a quick one. Just uh, uh, if it's because of the surface tension, is it like passing an electric uh, current through it affect on the surface tension? Mm -hmm. yeah, these are my okay. questions. Yeah, thank those you. Are, thank yes, you. thank you, uh, Xiao Cheng. That, those are very good questions. And um, there is a, a wide range of forces playing at the interface between the cell right. and the nanopillar. So absolutely, yes, there is, surface tensions does affect the initial attachment of the cells to the surface. But the cells um, do not attach to just any surface. So the cells will not attach to the surface unless there's some kind of protein that is coating the surface. So I, this is a very inaccurate schematic that I'm showing here, but it's uh, just the schematic. So um, it's good that you asked this question. So the cells, you see these red um, uh, points that I'm showing, those are mm -hmm. a bunch of proteins that are recruited at the membrane okay. of the cell. And they interact, they, they form you know, bonds with the proteins that are actually on the metallic surface as well. So these mm -hmm. are either proteins that we have coated on the metallic surface mm -hmm. um, that cells you know, like to attach to. And basically oh. it's just food for the cells if you think about it. Or okay. they can be just proteins absorbed from the, the media of, that, we, that we culture the mm. cells in. So because it's a metallic surface, a lot of these proteins get absorbed on the surface. Okay. And so the cells can attach. So the cells are never actually attaching directly to the metal. Oh, okay. That yes, there's always some matrix of proteins that the cells actually interact mm -hmm. with. Okay. Yeah. And then the and second question yeah. was that yeah. Um, so we do believe actually, if the electric pulse is, is high, it can sometimes separate um, completely um, remove these cells or these attachments from from the cells. The electric pulses that we're applying, we don't see any detachment. Um, mm -hmm. Because first of all, they're only 200 microseconds, um, okay. so they're very short pulses. We don't think they're causing anything, but um, there there could be other things that go on at this interface if you increase those voltages. Okay, I see. Yeah, that's really curious. The things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your You're answer. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Next one is Chen. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have a question. Thanks, thanks for just name for your wonderful talk. Uh, I just have a quick, quick question about. Uh, I'm I'm a first year year e electro engineering PhD, so I'm mm -hmm. looking for a project. I'm also very interested in kind of neural electrodes interface, this kind of mm -hmm. interface. So I wonder, mm -hmm. what's your opinion on rigid electrodes compared to flexible electrodes for in, in vivo measurement? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So um, obviously, flexible electrodes have much more potential. In many ways, um, but the the limiting factor would be if we could get the same signals that we do get with rigid electrodes from, um, you know, soft electronics. Um, I I personally think that yeah, the the soft electronics um, for implantable devices have have more potential than rigid electronics because um, you know in the body that 
I don't think the cells will like we there's a lot of studies on this, but the cells don't particularly like you know rigid objects um, inserted into um, mm -hmm. they disrupt the the interfaces between the, the neurons. But my hope is that so for all the work that I presented is mostly on a chip and for you know early drug development. So for these, um, it's very uh, acceptable to use rigid um, electronics, but it would be nice if you could combine the rigid electronics if, if they're doing very sensitive recordings with some kind of soft substrates that the cells can actually sit on. The pillars can be rigid, but the substrate itself can, can be somehow soft. Um, so there's well, some ways to combine these, yeah. So I, I, I wonder what's your opinion towards so Michigan array. So I, I think it's a very commercialized array yes, for, yeah, for electron measuring. Yeah. And it's rigid. And yeah. so it's, yeah, and also there are some CMOS technique for measuring the electricity in the cell. Use CMOS. Mm -hmm. So what was your idea towards this kind of uh, techniques? Yeah, absolutely. So the CMOS technology for um, obviously um, increases the throughput. So um, definitely the CMOS technology is all of these can be expanded to CMOS technology. Uh, we work more at the, the interface of the cells with the pillars and, and you know smaller scales, but the CMOS technology increases the throughput. And then the, um, the arrays that are rigid, I know some of them, I'm not exactly uh, remember whether this is the case, but they're longer pillars that are, um, even though they're rigid, they're the high aspect ratio makes them somewhat flexible from what I remember. Is that right? It's, yes. Yeah. So for Michigan, the Michigan probe is flexible. Uh, the Yotar array and the, and the like neuron pixel now were rigid. Absolutely rigid. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can see the new generations are mostly flexible for implant, implantable sensors. Even for wearable devices, you can see that flexible electronics are, are much more you know, exciting for a lot of people than, than rigid ones. Yeah, and even yeah. Neuralink, they're also using uh, polymer electrodes. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. The next, next one is Ke Wang. Uh, do you have a question? He's, he's muted. Let's see. Okay, do we have more questions from the panelists or the audience? I think if not, then we oh, can. I have one. I see one last question. I'll just mention okay. that. Um, what is how long can your measurement be stable? Can you account for cell migration over time? So um, with these um, heart muscle cells, we notice that we don't get cell migration. They don't move um, after they have a confluent layer. They they barely move over time. So after they've reached a, a confluency, we can measure for um, the longest we've done is two months of, of the cells being on our chips and doing measurements. So they seem to be very healthy on the surface. So this is cardiomyocyte. So I don't know for neurons what the answer would be. And um, very good question. Can, I, can we measure other signals? Um, that's that's a one project that we're working on in my lab. It's, building on the functionality of the sensing to measure more than just voltage, especially from cardiomyocytes. So being able to measure forces and some chemical, uh, other chemical measurements like measuring ions. So very good question there. Yeah, I think, uh, hi. Hi, yeah, I have one more, one more questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Jahid for accepting our invitation to present uh, your exciting work here. And mm -hmm. I have a question about the can you share your opinion on the broad potential applications like for your lab's work? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, my, my uh, lab work is, is threefold, um, looking at you know, some fundamental aspects of the interface of nanomaterials and, and um, biological systems. For that, the impact is, um, although not immediate, I think great. Um, which is if you know uh, the, how um, the cell interactions happen at the interface and what effect these sensors have on the biological system, for example, um, whether they can change the signaling, um, like the gene signaling of the cells, whether they can um, you know, change any kind of uh, fundamental structures in the cell. Uh, you know, these are very important questions that we have to answer. 
and so the impact of that is both in designing nanomaterials and also understanding of the um, of how cells respond to to these materials. And then the electronics itself, um, I think one um, imp large impact, at least um, for the kind of work that we're doing right now, is um, accelerating drug development, as I mentioned. So um, I think a lot of people talk about this is like not. The, reducing the need for using other animal models and actually being able to use human cells to, to test various drugs um, for, for patients and see the effect of the drug on the, on the patient cells themselves. And then finally, um, the impact of the uh, third part of my talk, which was the um, machine learning aspect of it is really um, trying to, to interpret these signals that we're getting. Um, even all the you know, sensors that are implanted in the brain, they're getting um, thousands, hundreds of gigabytes of data, you know, um, per an hour of recording. And so it's really, really important to be able to um, find patterns in these signals.